Live from Blue Wire Studios here at The Win in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's episode 603 of The O Show. We are presented by Jack O'Hara TV. Head on over to our YouTube channel at Jack O'Hara TV. You can like, comment, and subscribe there. Uh, and again, episode 603, we got Murray back in the house today. He was here with Chris Van Vliet last week. I was telling him, nicest guy in the world. It's like, you got to hook up with Murray. And here we are. <laughs> and here we are again. Later. I feel like I'm living here. This I didn't my expect to get now. a response that quickly. I don't waste time. If anyone knows who I am, I'm always got my phone in my hand, and I always reply. You know, yes, no, or indifferent, or a happy face. You know, it's just the way I operate. That's know? literally what I love about this industry is the art of communication is so key in yes. order to get things done. Everybody's got a sense of urgency. Where like other friends that I have who aren't in this space, it like takes them four or five hours to respond to a yes. text message. And I'm like, I've already moved on to like 10 different things. <laughs> Isn't that the truth, though? That's one of my biggest frustrations when people have phones now because my phone's on me. If I don't answer you for a day, it's because I didn't want to answer you for a day. I mean, that's that's just who I am. Yeah. But but everybody I answer usually good, bad, and different, and then I can get on with it. Because if I don't answer it right away, I'll forget about it usually. You know, or just, you know, things get busy. Exactly. So, and yeah. some of those are like important emails and text messages. Yeah. Too, where you're like, oh, man, I can't wait to get around to that. And then you just put your phone down. And then once you forget about it, you're like, oh, God. Gone. Yeah. Into the abyss. Mm -hmm. it's true you yeah. know it, it's difficult but i appreciate you coming by at 10 o'clock in the morning i know Friday. this is early for a vegas entertainer we usually go to bed about one or two in the morning so you're saying you're saying you're a morning person though so it helps out yeah it helps i like if i have a reason to get up i'll get up you know yeah. what i mean like my wife though she loves to sleep in the morning she's a night person she'll stay at four or five in the morning watching tv or netflix or working on something whereas for me if i have to get up i'll get up and start the day and once i'm up i'm up you know the mm -hmm. day has started you know so now is this your hairstyle yes it, well, it's not mine, you know. I, I would say I probably stole my hairstyle yeah. from Rod Stewart, um, from an older comedian years ago named Phyllis Diller. Um, anybody like that, Fido Dito. All the heroes. I get it all, I get it yeah. all yeah. So I, uh, as a kid growing up, I always wanted, when I wasn't that talented, and that's debatable now, um, that uh, I wanted to look, that I looked somewhat important or different or unique. You know, like the people I watched growing up, Lucille Ball or... Howard Stern, or all these different people had different looks that kind of... Yeah, you take you bits know. and pieces from everybody that you kind of idolize and look up to. Yeah, and it's, it's fun when you can do this because you can hide behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get dressed up or whatever, if you're an entertainer, you can hide behind whatever that look or brand or character you are. And it kind of feels like you're on or you're playing the character, you know. If you yeah. come to my house, I'm wearing a baseball cap and a robe. I don't shave because uh, it's my house, and that's that's what it, when I go out, though, I kind of, you know... I know everything. you're all bedazzled this morning. I know. Look at isn't this blue cool? Jacket. I got this for a Christmas present, a secret Santa gift from a entertainer named Ann Martinez in town. Yeah, she'd be great in your show. She is. Um, she was in Bad Out Hell, and she's also a singer of Fantasy at the Luxor. Phenomenal, and she also bedazzles stuff. So I thought, you know what? I haven't really worn this on any talk show, so I thought it was my first time wearing it. So, so there you go. We really lucked out with all blue today. Yeah, boy, did we got the memo, didn't I know. we? No, I know matches the backdrop. This is good. I mean, look at backdrop this, huh? jackets, yes. blue wire. See, look, it's like an ad for Macy's it. right here. Look at this. It's something, right? See? We did it. We did it right. <laughs> exactly. But you, you, sir, are a magician. Yes, a yeah. very good one at that. I've seen a lot of videos. Thanks. And I've seen a lot of musicians, uh, um, uh -huh. magicians as well. Yes. And yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I've been very fortunate, you know, I've done it as a kid. And ironically, I was used to be a musician as well. So I played music for like 11, 11 years, you know, and I liked it. But I never got into that garage band kind of vibe where I could learn music myself, you know. But magic kind of gave me the outlet where I could just kind of create things and come up with different ideas and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, since Van I'm from Vancouver, Canada, since I was like seven years old, just kind of doing my thing, you know. I mean, you got your first paid gig when you were like, what, 11 years old? Yeah, 11, 12. Uh, 13 I got an, it was from my aunt and uncle um they they booked me because I just got this magic kit and they thought it was cute for their I think it was their grandkids and uh, I got paid 10 bucks and uh just couldn't believe I got paid to do something I like doing you know and I had a great time and it was a kid's birthday party and it was funny because the kids weren't much much younger than I was you know what I mean they're older you know so yeah and did that that was kind of cool so I just that's really I mean at least in my generation and generations that are going to be coming up Nobody works anymore. Like, I remember no. my first job, I think I was 15 or 16 years old, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I started working at 11 at a bakery, and I had a paper route as a kid. You know, I deliver papers every day. I love making money. I realized if you had money, you could afford things and then get ahead in life. You know what I mean? That's kind of the way it worked because my parents were very hard workers, and I never got an allowance growing up. You know, it was you live in my house. Uh, you help do the laundry. You help rake the leaves. There's no, I'm not paying you to do it. You want a roof over your head? And become an adult, you go rake the leaves. You know, dad's coming home soon. He, you know, puts food on the table and mom takes care of the house and raised me and all that. So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of the way I was raised. 
and that's the right way to be raised, ladies and gentlemen. Right. It there. works for some, you know? you know. It works for some. So what know. what do you think made you know the first magic kit that you bought for ten bucks stand out as opposed to because like I got a magic kit when I was a kid for Christmas. I feel yeah. like a lot of people did. Why did it stick out for you? It's strange. I don't know. You know, certain kids get a go kart and now they're NASCAR drivers. You know. Certain kids get a sewing kit, and now they're, you know, Vera Wang making dresses. You know, I don't know. I think it depends what twigs to you. And then also, I think it's your support system. You know, if you've got a supportive family or friends, you don't need to have a supportive family either to be successful. There's a lot of wonderful success stories where the families were against people doing what they loved, and they become very successful because that, that fired them to get going and be better and prove them wrong that this could be a success, whatever that might be. So everyone has their own reasons of getting in, whether support or not support. Um, I always tell people, just don't make excuses. Go do it. You know, time is of the essence, you know. And as you get older, you really realize that, you know. Yeah. And no one else cares more about you than you. You know what I mean? So, you know, don't be narcissistic. Don't be cocky. Don't be self-centered. But if you really believe in something and you want to do it, work hard at it. You know, you're going to have your crappy days. You know, you're going to have those days where, wow, I want to, you know, I want to give it all up and go to Home Depot and have a job or Starbucks, something easy and very, you know, pays great and you make some great friends and you just kind of go to work and have your weekends off, you know, and nothing's wrong with that either, you know, but if you really want to go for it, nothing's easy, nothing's handed no. to you, you know, no one said it was going to be, you know. So. That's like the number one cliche on social media now where it's like being married's hard or being divorced is hard, choose your hard, right? Yes. Yeah. It's like true. either way you're going to, yeah, nothing's easy and if it was easy, you'd still be miserable. Totally. It'd be boring. Yeah. And I think when you look at social media, the good and bad things about social media, we all know, but when you see your friends on social media, I mean, it looks like a great time. And yeah, you know, there's some amazing moments in life. But as you know, there's 24 hours in a day. And not every hour is amazing. It just isn't. You know, you have a headache, you have an argument, whatever the case is, um, or you lose a job, you know, or money, or whatever the case is. But we don't usually post those things on social media, you know, mm -hmm. or some do. And they lean on that a lot, which is fine as well, but then don't be too negative either, you know? Exactly. Life's not that horrible if you're breathing and alive, you know? No, 100%. Yeah. When you were 11 doing that first show, that first paid gig, was it like, this is what I'm doing? Or was it a success? First and foremost? Yeah, I guess it was. You know, none of the tricks went wrong. People kind of clapped and reacted. You know, and doing kids' birthday parties are not easy. You know, especially when you're a kid yourself. Cause, because, you know, you, you go into that and then you're expecting attention to them to watch. Well, kids are kids. You know, and then when you're a kid yourself trying to be an adult, it's just a really weird experience, you know. Um, but the tricks all worked. I thought it was kind of cool. And I thought, what a fun way to make a few bucks. And then, of course, I started learning on how to sell myself. Just from watching things around, I'm really an observant person, you know. So how do you become successful? Will you emulate other successful people, you know, or even copy them? You know, how do you become a comedian? You usually don't write your own joke the first time. You steal a joke or get a joke book and, and say a funny line and maybe change it to what suits you, you know. And then as you become that, you realize, okay, the more and more I can become original and different, now I have my own audience. Now I have my own thing that nobody can really take away, mm -hmm. you know. And that's kind of like, you know. Be, you know, be the Bugs Bunny and all the rabbits out there. Just don't be a rabbit, you know? Exactly. So, it kind of yeah. goes back to, like, not, <clears throat> like, mimicking yourself after someone else, but, like, taking bits and pieces, like you said, like, you growing up on some of your idols and taking bits and pieces there and forming it into your own personality, your own vibe. Yeah. You know, the, only, the one thing that nobody else has. Totally, you know, and, and, you know, do things that get a reaction or that are interested, people are interested in, you know, whatever you're doing. I don't care what's a landscaping company or your plumber or your doctor, lawyer. Be that cool person. If you're a doctor, be a cool doctor. Be, you know, be true to yourself. You know what I mean? If somebody's scared when they come into your office as a doctor, then understand that and share that with them. If you're a dentist, accept that and, and be cool like that. Don't just, just do it by the book, which a lot of people do, mm -hmm. and that's fine, you know. But put a little personality into anything you do, and it will make it yours, whether you like it or not. You yeah. know, and, that's, and no one's you. That's exactly. it. No one can, even though you may not... Think, you know, everyone thinks they're not the greatest thing at the time, but no one can be you, you know, so be you. And it's like about being aware. I talked about this on our last show, too, where it was like, do what you want to do. Make no excuses because it's very easy to make excuses, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, like I want to be I want to go outside and practice. If you want to be an athlete, oh, it's raining outside. We're not going to practice today. Like, that's right. Yeah. Hold yourself accountable for things. Yeah. No excuses. You know what I mean? And don't. Do the what was me? Well, if I had this, or if I had rich parents, or yeah. if I had that. Well, great. You know, unfortunately, yeah. when you're born, you're given what you're given, 
Um, so go for it. Hop in and and do the best you can and work hard. You know, people always say, you know, if you can dream it, you can do it. Yeah, you can. But people also forget to add in that you have to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week to make the dream happen. It's mm -hmm. not just going to be, you know, it's not just going to be you send one letter to one producer or director or job um, employment office and you'll get the dream job. I mean, uh, that's the biggest thing I get asked all the time, what my biggest, you know, big break was and i feel like it's a bunch of little breaks you know when people find out when your big break was it's usually for the person watching you a different time than when it was for you because when they first recognized you on what podcast or tv show or youtube video or whatever it might be your moment might have been meeting somebody doing something having that opportunity to expand who you are and what you do you know mm -hmm. so it's always different for the viewer you know how early did you feel like you were getting recognized like even just like growing up in your own town because i know you grew up in the same town as michael buble right yeah you we guys were just together. like winning awards left and right yeah. like you guys were obviously like the two alphas in what you were doing at the time yeah we were just doing what we love we had supportive parents and people you know we we're from burnaby british columbia actually my wife just did a show with michael buble in pittsburgh a private uh, corporate show for the guy that invented 84 lumber mm. the big lumber company with the big 84 the red logo it's kind yeah. of everywhere and he turned 100. And can you believe he turned 100? And all the girls flew in because they wanted showgirls. And then Buble did a 75-minute show after. And they showed up in the contract. They said, if um, I think the name was John Hardy. If he passes away, um, the contract's off because he's 100 years old. And I guess they had this in his contract for years. Because, you know, at 100, you're, you know, every morning you wake up, you kind of go, oh, hey, we're still in the game. Let's yeah. go. So they actually got there that morning for, for that rehearsal, Saturday morning. Can you believe they said he's not going to come to the show at his resort, but he'll be at home streaming it? Cool. And they've got 200 of his guests coming. And then can you believe by about 2 or 3 o'clock that afternoon, they said he passed away. But they were all there, and everyone who was coming was still his friends and family. It was a celebration of life now. Because at 100, let's be honest, you got to be happy for the man. That's pretty awesome. And what he worked for. So, yes, yeah, so the girls did the showgirl gig. Um, and then Buble came out and did 75 minutes, and it was about 200 people. I mean, what a cool environment, you know? And, and, um, and one of those things, Buble said, uh, you know, my wife said, what a weird kind of cool gig we're doing, because yeah. he plays arenas, you know? Mm -hmm. And my wife here hosts shows in Vegas, so to have those little cool moments in the business is a pretty cool thing, you know? That's so, a really cool story. You know, yeah. And yeah. Did he just die in his sleep? Was I guess so. Sleep? And, I, you know, I guess towards the end of that year, I guess – New Year's, it was going downhill a bit from what we heard, you know. And then, you know, but at 100, you're thinking, well, that's pretty amazing. You made 100. Look at Betty White. We all wanted Betty White oh, to make 100. Yeah. She, she was a few weeks short, right? And I, just, I think once you get past, like, 95, you think, holy smokes, you know, the end of the goal line's right there. We can we make it, make it, you know. Yeah. So, um, but, yeah, me and Buble, were, she, he was a singer, obviously, in Vancouver and BC, and we do little variety shows and stuff like that. And, I'd, you know, if we did competitions, I'd win the – the variety category as a magician, and then he'd win vocal categories, and that he had very supportive parents and all that, you know, and uh, and yeah, a lot of people from Vancouver, Canada, all of Canada, come down to the states and expand their career, you know. Mm -hmm. He's done an amazing job. I mean, Bublé's killing it. Oh my God! You and know? That, I mean, that's insane to have the two of you grown up in such a small town as well, and just yeah. like above and like, did you know at the time? Like, probably not at the time, but looking back at it, like you guys were very good at your own specific crafts. I guess so. But More so it, than most people, because, like, obviously, big fish, small pond, right? That's like right. Anybody could look great. Exactly. But at the same time, when you actually go out there and you realize, like, oh, we actually have something here. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you don't realize it at the time because you're just excited to be doing what you're doing. And you have friends in the business, you know, and, and they kind of like now when you're level, you have somebody that you're doing a show with, and they, they talk, oh, I'm going to go on this reality show. I don't think it's going to be that big a deal. But what's it called? Oh, it's something called Jersey Shore. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then, of course, Jersey Shore. Go, Holy smokes, that was you, dude. You know, even my wife... Danny had a friend on a Queer Eye for the Straight guy, and he was just a guy trying to make it in L.A., and all of a sudden he got that show, became a huge star, you know. So, you know, it's a, it's a lot of hard work and luck, perseverance, you know, and just being nice to people. You know, that's also another thing, reason how you get further ahead, you know, and, and don't take for granted where you're at because it can be all taken away overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, it really can, you know. Oh, yeah, especially in this line of work. Like you said, you have to keep going every single day. Right. Yes. It, like if you stop, the dream stops. It all yes. lives and dies with you. And if you're an asshole, if you're treating people a certain way, yes, you're not going to be asked back to do certain things. Totally. And work hard. Sacrifice. You know, if you really want something, sacrifice for it. You know, you know I mean, go. I, I remember coming to Vegas, and I wanted to be a comedian and be funny, and I wasn't that funny. I could be funny talking to you here 
um, just as friends, but actually on stage is a different funny, you know. So I drive to yeah. LA and do open mics and stuff like that, and see a lot of different people, you know, trying to make it. And, and but they're working hard, sleeping in their cars, you know, and doing odd jobs to pay the rent just because they had that dream of being a comedian or a magician or a musician or a singer or whatever that might be. You know, don't be afraid to work hard and take three steps back to go four forward, which would equal one step forward. You know. So those, those stories are way cooler than, oh, yeah, I've worked at this sales company for the last 30 years. Yeah. You know, 100 percent, you know, but a lot comfortable, of comfortable, but you don't have the story. Yeah. And a lot of people don't want to sacrifice for getting ahead. You know, they, they want to do certain things and have a certain life. They want to drive a BMW or Mercedes right away. They want to live on the beach right away. You know, they want to drink Starbucks coffee every morning and not buy a ground of coffee where it's cheaper just to save money to better their career or put that money into acting lessons or or vocal lessons or whatever you might want to do you know but you can't it's pretty hard to have both unless you got really rich parents or somebody or somebody died and you got an inheritance you just spend money like it's water yeah. but even that doesn't fare well you know how many kids get their parents company and run to the ground because the father or the mother is the one that invented it and they had the love and the passion and then when you're handed it to you sometimes you just don't understand how to make that a success or keep it going you know no. I, mean? So. I mean, that's the difference between people who are born with connections and mm -hmm. people who actually worked really hard to build those connections. Because you actually have the grit and, like, you know how to operate in that situation as opposed to someone who's just being handed, you know, like a multi-billion dollar corporation and then you run it into the yeah. ground because you don't know how to socially behave yourself. Totally. Yeah, exactly. And I see it a lot with a lot of people, you know, and the old money, they call it, you know, and, and the young kids come in and they try to run the best they can. But some are also very successful. Some come in and they take it to the next level, meaning doing new and different things with it. You know, look at the Walt Disney Corporation. I mean, it wasn't necessarily family ran after that, but it was. There's brothers and stuff like that. But but they took Disney from what he started and look at it now, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think they really, they brought it to an unbelievable level. You know, oh. good, bad, and indifferent, but I think that's one of those success stories. But also it had corporations and people and very, very successful presidents and, you know, and some that weren't that successful, you mm -hmm. know, but you live and learn. And you also got to be very well-rounded, too. Where, like, yeah. you, you have your niche, but at the same mm -hmm. time, like, you're doing all this other stuff. You mentioned comedy, you know, yes. going on a plethora of different shows, right? Yes, yeah. Like, Pawn Stars is probably a show that people are like, oh, yeah, I've noticed you from... Yeah, I've been on that show, what, 15 years now, you know, and they're yeah. going for their 19th season, I think. And and then just airing in February 11, we just got our notes. We're airing Masters of Illusion, which is the show I'm on on CW in our ninth season. You know, we're hoping to get a 10th, but, you know, I've done it for nine years now. Where does the time go, you know? But, but, and a lot of people take that show for granted, you know, when you're on a show. And you, you got to remember how hard you work to try to be on that show, you know? So don't take it for granted that once you're on it, now there's bigger and better things. Yeah, sure, there, there might be. But also have respect for those days when you, you would give anything to be on that show mm -hmm. or do that, you know? And, and don't be hard to work for it. Don't, and, and remember when you come into a show, it takes everybody. You know, it's you and me, I here, but there's people behind the mirrors and the glass and these lights and the LED walls and setting all this up. It takes a ton of people to make a show happen and make you look good or me yeah. look good. You know? We're just so the we're, puppets right now. Totally. Right? And respect that. Respect these people who've worked hard all their lives to do what they're doing now as well to make other people look good. You know, when I walk on stage, we have seven to ten stage crew, you know, spotlights and music operators and curtain pullers, and, and they're phenomenal at what they do, you know. so It's almost as if... You got to look back at like you five years ago would have died to be in this position, right? Totally. And then you don't like you're very grateful for it, but at the same time, like it doesn't feel as mm -hmm. exciting as you, maybe like you from five years prior thought it would. Yeah. And you just got to be grateful for the situation and move forward and um, continue to do what you do because that's totally. what you wanted. Of course. That's what you asked for. Yeah. You know? And don't forget when you're in the business what you were going through to get there or not, you know, or if you were mistreated, remember to not do that to somebody. You don't don't repeat that you know, pattern to somebody else. You know yeah. I mean? So, yeah. So what kind of like sparked the idea of you like, okay, I have this and this is going really well. How can I capitalize on it and start, you know, getting my name and face out there on a Pawn Stars, a deal or no deal or like any one of these, you know, random shows? Because it's fun, but at sure. the same time, like why? Well, I think, you know, when I came into the business, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s, you know, internet wasn't around and then internet came around. You know, and then social media came around. Then the phones that we can just walk everywhere with our computers in our hands. That's what it is. It's not a phone. It's a computer, you know. And everything's at the axis of our fingertips now. You know, back in the day, you know, you used to watch news in the morning on a television. You have to get up and go downstairs or wake up and turn on your bedroom, watch the news. Now we can just turn our phone on, flip down TMZ or whoever we want to look at, 
and it's handed to us in our bedrooms or wherever we are, you know. And when you have that access, and it's also free to a degree, if you're on the other side of the coin, like an entertainer, you know, or a host like yourself, you have this access to getting yourself out there and exposing yourself in a good way that you can get a fan base and also, you know, push your professional, you know, performance, whatever that might be. And when you have that handed to you, back in the day, to get in the newspaper, you either had to buy an ad or really make up a great story to be interviewed by. You know what I mean? A feel-good story or usually a tragic story. That's how you got in the newspaper, you know? And that's the only kind of way you got out there, you know? So now you can actually make up your own story almost online, you know, and create a fan base. But that also takes work as well because now everyone can do it. So that's the other difference. You know, when you're on social media, we can all make a Twitter site, a website, a podcast, a website of our own, whatever the heck, almost our own TV show now. But now there's, everyone's doing it, you know, so how do you make that different? Well, you make it different be, being genuine and honest and real and try to have a little hook or something different that no one else has, you know, and, and share that with people and do the best you can, you know, yeah. and, and at the end, you should hopefully, you know, prevail. That's how it's going to keep going, too. Mm -hmm. I think. Van Vliet always said that too. Like the best thing about starting a podcast is that any, anybody could do a podcast. The worst thing about doing a podcast, anybody could do yes. it. And there are hundreds upon thousands of shows out there that you don't hear of because, yeah. you know, they don't stand out. They don't have the best production. They mm -hmm. aren't putting out clips. They're not doing all the things that are necessary to really get it out there and expose yourself and grow yes. yourself. 100%. What do you think helps? What do you think helped you from a social media aspect? Obviously, you've been around. A mm -hmm. while, but at the same time, everything gets lost in the algorithm. What do you think yeah. made it successful? I think also uh, taking something and rebranding it for the market. So what I mean by that is, say, whatever you do, you go, well, if it's good, people will find me. Well, that's yes and no. Some people will find you. But you also got to figure out what's trending, what people like, what people don't like, what will twig a human interest story that people will get. Same thing that, like I said, TMZ or newscast do or Entertainment Tonight or People Magazine, they're they're at the top of that that game of trying to get your attention. Because that's really what it is. And then you read the article, it might be as exciting as it is, or maybe it's not, you know. So for us, for me, we twigged in with my producer who does all my social media videos and stuff is Seth Leach. We've been, you know, business partners for about eight, nine years now. And he liked my magic. He said, look, you in front of a screen doing tricks isn't, it's lovely, but it's not going to do a lot because the tricks are good. You've done them on TV, all right? We need to find a hook why you're doing the trick and and have a reason to bring you into a forefront of that trick is cool again. And I said, fair enough, because he was a lot younger than I am and he was, he was in the know. And so we decided doing magic with cops and, and homeless people and, and, um, and people that were parking attendants, you know, and being a bit of disruptive youth towards that, but still getting a magic trick across. So all of a sudden these old magic tricks that have been around for 100 years are cool again because now we're pranking something and doing something we probably shouldn't be doing, but it's not but it's that entertaining. Ridiculous. Exactly. Yeah. So you take this cheesy kind of whatever trick and you put it into a, in a venue that's kind of cool and, and interesting, which is basically instead of taking it on stage, we took it to the streets, you know, and, uh, and it was widely successful for us. So Yeah, it's yeah. almost like a grunge type feel. Totally. Exactly. It's almost so. like a revolution that you start up. Yeah. And it was like kind of like doing the man in the street thing, you know, where talk shows used to be just like we're sitting here now, you know, in a nice, beautiful studio and talking. But then you had Jay Leno going in the streets or all sorts of people going in the streets asking who's the first president of the United States or, you know, what color is, you know, um, Papa Smurf. You know, stupid. And people were like, I don't know, purple, because people wouldn't know that. So it became a very funny thing. So you're taking in this really cool studio, you're taking your fame, fortune, notoriety into the middle of a street and asking people questions. So all of a sudden, you look the part, you have the intelligence to interview people, but now you're asking random people a really simple exactly. question, getting a ridiculous answer is which, which is what you want. And yeah. you only edit those ridiculous answers. You don't add, you know, obviously edit the ones that they answer correctly because there's no entertainment in that because we know Papa Smurf is blue. Well, most of us do. So, you know. That's why you got to take bits and pieces from the people who know how to, like when they see the camera, they're like, oh, I know what to do. Got to be entertaining. How am I going to stand out so that they actually put me in this reel that's going to air later? Exactly. It, it goes back to the art of communication. Like people sure. who just don't know how to answer simple questions compared yeah. to people who are like, oh, I've watched the show before. I know how this works. 100%. It makes a big difference, you know. But anything has that hook or difference in it because you want to catch people's attention for a certain amount of time, you know, whether it be a movie for an hour and a half, sitcom for half an hour, or just a video clip on YouTube for a minute and a half. You know, you want to find what makes people tick. You know, Have you done any movies? 
Uh, I've been in a couple of movies. I just finished shooting a movie that was in town. Actually, uh, Carrot Top, my buddy was in it as well. Just doing a guest appearance, um, a cameo in it, and it's called the um, the Comic uh, Store, and um, it's it's about a comic book kind of convention and and the store that sells comic books and the, and the people that revolve around around it. And I played a writer like a Stan Lee uh, f- at this convention just for a bit part, and I'm not sure what Carrot Top did, but we just did that shot that before the end of the year, and uh, but yeah, I've been in a few things here and there. You know, I, I do a lot of obviously TV appearances guest starring kind of roles as, as just either a waiter or a ridiculous neighbor or something like that, you know. So Those are the best roles to play, especially mm-hmm. if you can get on a show that takes off. You're like, oh, yeah. I yes. just rode that out for a little while. Very lucky, you know. Or like Pawn Stars. I was very lucky. Yeah. I knew the guys. When we were on the road. They needed a host. I just got off America's Got Talent. And they were on the road together. They became my friends. And he's like, hey, we should have you on the show. I'm like, yeah. He says, you good at anything? I'm like, that's debatable. <laughs> so I said, well, I like history of magic. So there it is. Why don't we find some historical stuff? Bring it on the show. You, you speak your word, and away you go. And I thought, all right, so, so yeah. When you're on America's Got Talent, are you surrounded by just a bunch of insanely, like, you look at other people that are on the show, you're like, oh, my God, like, nobody else can do that. Or are there some duds in there, too, that you're yeah. like, oh, they're going to get? The years I was on, I was in the first five years, so I was in season five, so that's 2010. So that's yeah. a long time ago now. Um, and... You got to remember back then they were trying to go on the acts that were horrible as well as the acts were brilliant, brilliant and horrible. That really was the angle. And then the storyline was a nice add on. Now things have changed where the storyline is almost everything raised by the wolves, you know, um, sleeping in alleys and lanes and now becoming this talented person. We, We all love a great story. And there's still drama, but on the show you'll see a few acts that are bad, but nothing compared to the years I was on the show. They were, you know, thriving on acts that were just horrible or get three X's because that was once again. But then as, as you see things change in the world, good, bad, and indifferent, you change your trend, you change what works, you know. And so when I went to America's Got Talent, you know, I didn't go on as a magician and here's my tricks. I went on going, you guys are interested in me, I'd love to do the show. What can I do on the show that as a producer, people would want to see? It's the same way I look at my life now. I didn't go on just here's my two tricks or three, take it or leave it, what can I create for that show that will get good exposure, be good for the show, if I was a producer of the show, and be good TV. So I, And everything, every trick I did on that show, I'd never done before. I, mm. I strictly did it for that show um, just because of the format and uh, what, what they were looking for. So, Now, did you perform those tricks in front of certain people to kind of get a good gist of, like, what they would... Yeah, I had an like? idea what the tricks would do, you know, and I had an idea of what, what the payoff was. But I would always write it into a hook that I liked or a look that I wanted for that show. And then that's kind of made it more successful on what I was doing on that. But I didn't really have a lot, a lot of time, you know, because when they wanted me, I got some tricks. I practiced them and I had a few weeks and then I put them on. And then as the show progressed, I kept staying on further. Your time was only about two to four weeks to get things ready, you know what I mean? Or even like 10 days. And so it gets quicker and quicker, you know. So, But yeah, it was a great show for me. And I think it's wonderful, great, great avenue for people to get started and get out there, or people who are already going, and to keep that, that you know, that entertainment and buzz out there about them. You know, I just saw Terry Fader on the show recently, and a few other ma- magic acts. Because when you have eight t- million people seeing you, or more, that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. You know. Who's one magician? You mentioned a few there. Whether mm-hmm. it be Terry, whether it be you know Scott Carrot Top, mm-hmm. like who do you enjoy um, touring with the most, working with? Or who, who do you look at and say, like, man, they have something that I wish I could have had? That's a great question. You know, I mean, I have a few very dear friends in magic. I think one of my dear friends, phenomenal, his name's Chris Funk. Mm-hmm. He goes by The Wonderist. He's from Vancouver, B.C. as well. Um, originally from the middle of Canada, a place called Winnipeg, but he lives in Vancouver with his wife now. And his two dogs, and we're, he's one of my best friends. He's a phenomenal magician, great act. Um, very original, very different, you know. He's worked at his craft all his life. You know, the other one is, is my guest act on my show and also best friend. His name's Lefty, Douglas Lefty Lefervich, you know. And we, he's been on my show since I opened at the Tropicana years ago and a very dear friend of mine. And very, probably one of the top magicians that slide a hand magic and card magic. So, um, and they're very dear friends of mine, you know what I mean? Um, but of course, I grew up watching David Copperfield, you know. Yeah. And Penn and Teller are phenomenal. Um, and, and there's a lot of great acts out there that bef- came before me, from the Blackstones to Thurston to Kellers. These are all magicians from the 1890s to 1940s and 60s. You know, so. What do you look at when you see a guy like David Blaine doing some of the things that he does? 
I think he's great. I think he's phenomenal. You know, once again, going back to that catching people's attention. You know, what people don't realize, if they know history, they do. He basically photocopied what Houdini did all those years ago in the early 1900s. He literally took every book uh, and read it and page for page of what he did, from his stunts when he started to even his posters with the stone lithograph look, which is an old printing process of posters that made that look, that almost drawing ink poster. His posters, well, he was coming, were all like that as well. So he really, really, which is great. Why not? You know, um, that's how we get better. We look at what worked and then add on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he took his magic to the streets, which Houdini really didn't do much street magic in his life, and he brought that to the forefront and really made that really great. The show here, I haven't seen the show at the Resorts World yet, uh, but here's phenomenal. You know, he's trying to get you in his head and his same style. He's not trying to be Vegasized or what he thinks would work in a different environment. He's sharing what David Blaine does yeah. for David Blaine, you know, and it's it's great. Everyone who's gone to see the show loves it, you know. I mean, it's almost like the art of illusion. Yes. Like almost tricking the human brain, right? Yeah. And the idea of an, being an entertainer is you want to give your viewers an experience for an hour and a half. I don't care whether you're a singer, whether you're, you know, you're Beyonce or you're Dwight Yoakam or you're George Strait or you're, you know, um, Machine Gun Kelly or a magician yeah. like myself, you want to take people when they come into that theater, take them away from everything for 90 minutes and put them in a fancy land. You know, make them forget about their debt or their money they're making or they're losing or relationships or whatever their worries are for that hour and a half. You know, take them to a fancy land, you know, and then and, and then if they leave happy, then they've done their jobs done, you know. Do you have a few specific shows that you've looked back on and say, like, I really killed it that night? You know, it's funny you mentioned killed it because I, I don't think I've ever used that word for myself. Yeah. Because, but my friends in the business use it as if it's second nature. Yeah. Oh, I killed it. I killed it. I'm like, you did not kill it. Now, I'll never tell them that because um, that's not my nature. But, I'm, you know, when you kill something, go watch Aerosmith. They kill it. Go watch the Rolling Stones. They kill it. Yeah. Go watch Kevin Hart. He kills it. David Chappelle. Kills it. That's killing it. So if there's any question of what killing it is, that's killing it. Doing well, doing great. Yes, I've done that a lot. Mm -hmm. But killing it, I think, is always in the eyes of the person watching you. They're the ones. Um, yeah, you walk off stage and you go, nailed it, felt great about that. Couldn't have done better for my life and my career at this exact moment. Loved every minute. But for me, the minute I say I've killed it means I'm good enough to not get better. So I try not to ever say that or even feel it because I know I can always do better. Am I not, not satisfied with it? No, I am satisfied with what I do because you've got to have some point of going, look, that was great. I'm enjoying myself. Don't always be hard on yourself. But, but for me to kill it, if I, if I feel like I haven't hit that yet, then I'll just keep going mm -hmm. and wanting to get better and wanting to make something more entertaining. You know? And it's not about the best trick or the best line. It's if that audience reacts to what you're doing, you've done your job. You know, I see a lot of magicians going, at the best trick in the world, it's going to blow your mind, but the reaction's not there. I'm like, well, it is great, and it looks amazing, but the audience isn't reacting, so you're not doing your job to get that right reaction from the audience. Mm. So there's a lot of easy tricks I do in my show, which people always make fun of me for, but the audience reacts really well. I'm like, I don't really care if the trick's not the most evolutionary effect, but if the audience is entertained, that's the bottom line, you know? Yeah. We t right before we came on, we kind of talked about, you know, sticking it out through the rough times, right? Whether it be like me as a podcaster, you as a magician, you know, like you're going to have dry periods there where it's just not hitting, it's not feeling right. Mm -hmm. You doubt yourself. Probably you doubt yourself more than other people doubt you most of the time. Though right. like the people that care about you the most might say, oh, you may as well just like get a comfortable mm -hmm. job out there, right? Yeah. When was that period for you where you felt like it wasn't hitting and you kind of had to come, not to a crossroads in a sense, but you kind of almost doubted the point where it's like, how, how much longer can I do this? Well, I don't, you know, I don't myself every day. I mean, I doubt the outfit I just put on today. Look at this thing. It's ridiculous. You know, and for those who can't see this and are listening to it, I'm wearing all sequins and a weird tie and a weird jacket. But, but. It's um, riveting. It's riveting. Yeah, I know, right? Um, I don't, you know, you doubt yourself all the time. I think if you're always self-checking yourself and worried about what you're seeing, what you're doing because um, you need to check in with yourself, you know what I mean? Um, I think it was, it was a, a point in my life where I was starting to tour and travel internationally. I, did a sh I went and got my first job in Japan for six months um, in an area called the Mie Prefecture, which is a couple hours south of, of um, Kyoto and stuff like that in Japan. 
And uh, I was very excited to play Japan. I thought, man, if I play Japan, this is it. This is going to put me over the top. I've gone, gone international now. I'm another, now I can play to other countries with, with you know, they, don't, they don't speak English and they can understand me. So I went there, did six months there, played two different hotels. I did 12 shows a week. I got four days off a month. So, you know, in, in six months, I got 24 days off. That's it. So you can't not become better when you work that much. If you don't, something's really wrong. Yeah. Even if you don't want to become better, I thought I'd come back and have lots of offers because now agents knew I went international, I traveled, I got all this. And I came back and I had four or five months where the phone didn't ring. I had no other work, didn't know what to do. So I'd already left the local hub of being in Vancouver, doing kids' birthday parties and, and that kind of realm of, you know, close-up magic at parties and cocktail parties and all that stuff that I would my main income was from. And I stopped that, went to Japan for six months. So I wasn't available in the city of Vancouver for six months. So agents, people stop calling because they need you to do a job. That's how they make money. So when you make that big leap, you come back to that and go, hey, I'm back in town. Give me some work. Oh, we already got Bob and Johnny and Susie over here doing your jobs. You know, they, they're good too. And all of a sudden, like, oh, interesting. I've taken this big jump. So now I'm this big stage performer and I'm traveling internationally. But now how do I go back to still doing stuff that pays the bills in my field? But yet I still want to take that big jump. So it's definitely a, a weird thing. So I had three to six months where I wasn't sure how I was going to pay the bills. Of course, I was still living with my parents at the time. So I was in my late teens, early 20s and getting ready to move on. And then over time, I, of course, found more work and hustled some more. So also, you know, it's kind of like in, in show business, when you have a job or a TV show, it's kind of like playing pool. When you shoot, if you know how to play pool, when you have that white ball and you're shooting the ball that should go in the pocket, don't worry about the ball that's going to go in the pocket. Worry about where the white ball lands for your next shot if you're a good pool player. Because if you only worry about the first shot, that ball is going to be somewhere else and you'll, you'll miss the second shot and now you're out of turn. So in life, for business at least, I share this with everybody, is do business like playing pool. Always worry about your next shot, not the one immediately. Mm -hmm. Same with life. Don't worry about what's happening right now or money right now that you're getting. Worry about where you're going to be in a year or two. So I got so many friends who try to do a job and they're not getting enough money for this job. But the exposure's great, the contact's great, the people are wonderful. I'm like, if you worry about that right now, why you're not getting paid so much money for this, worry about where you're going to be in a year. Because all those other jobs, will, you'll make more money and more connections and be more successful worrying about something a year away than something right now. And people are so short term um, and, and so and they don't look past the goal point, you know. And, and so that's, that's my, that's my, look on everything you know always look a little further you know mm -hmm. and then, so when you're doing when you're doing shows and that you know worry about the next show or the next interview guest yeah. like you uh, and the next thing we you know and that way you always have somebody lined up or something going on for yourself mm -hmm. that's how you keep things exciting too totally like, i feel like people get too wrapped up in the short short-term pain of mm -hmm. things like when things aren't going their way where it's like if you keep going at this a year yeah. two three years four years five years down the line like it's yeah. not going to be the same it's short that's term right. that's right but some people just Yes. want to be comfortable. That's right. Or they're worried about you know day to day and stuff like that, yeah. which is fine. But unfortunately, you got to look at the long look at the long game. You yeah. know what I mean, in order to be comfortable, get uncomfortable. Yes, it's true. Yeah. You know, life is short, but it also is long. You know what I mean? If you live a full length length of life, you still got to live your life, enjoy, it, pay your bills, be nice to people, and all that stuff. And and so you know, keep that in consideration. You know. So on that note, what are you looking forward to the most in your profession, whether it be certain projects that you have just like spewing around in your brain right now or things that you got on the horizon? Um, I'm always excited. I'm always working on something. I have a couple of new TV things I'm working on right now um, where I'm the producer of, so we're in the, in the pitch process of that. I'm also working on my second comedy special. My first one just came out in December on Tubi, um, and it's an hour and 15-minute special. So in this year, I'm working on my second special, and we're just in the works of putting that together now. And we're probably going to maybe shoot that late spring, early summer. And um, and then some more touring dates, you know. I want to travel a bit more, you know. I love my shows in here, Tropicana, of course, uh, and, of course, Fantasy at the Luxor, which I love doing the show. And, you know, got the most beautiful girls in the world, Fantasy, so I'm yeah. very fortunate to be working there. Um, but I've always got a new project. I'm always working on something new, always writing something, you know, and, and, and always pushing forward because that's, that's what makes me get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to think and see what the next day holds. I just love being busy. I love being active, you know. Just have like hundreds of different things like, oh, let me write that down, mm -hmm. you know. Let yeah. me come back around to it. Have a notebook. Write a notebook down, you know. I, I, I know we have our phones now, but I'm very old-fashioned. I like writing stuff down. I, mean, I use my phone. That's how you retain the information more anyways. Totally. Because when I write it down, I actually memorize it and it's in my head because I've physically done it. Typing my phone as we do typing all the time, it happens so fast. It, I don't, it doesn't lock into my head. When I actually physically
physically write something. Even when I do a new joke, I write the joke out because for some reason I physically took the time to read it, write it, and put it down and see it. So, yeah, if you have new projects or ideas, have a notepad by your bed or by your desk or by your in the living room by the TV. So when you think of an idea or a new thing to do, write it down. That way you don't forget it, you know, because those ideas you may come back to a year, six months away and go, hey, that's a cool idea. Or that's something I should should put more effort into, you know. Yeah. What's the best idea that you thought you had that didn't work out? Like it just didn't get a great crowd reaction or? You know, it's funny. I had an idea right when TSA came in. It was after 9-11 and you had to go through TSA checks for flying and then they had the, the metal wands, you know, that you beep over yourself. Yeah. And I had this great idea about a metal wand and a magic trick where I, I have this metal wand that tells you where metal objects are, right? We've all seen it, the beeps. And I thought, what a cool idea of banishing a coin, you know, or something metal. It disappears, and this wand that I'm using, this TSA thing, gives away where the coin is because it's a metal detector. And I travel, I bought this really nice metal detector wand. I switched it so I could make it beep whenever I wanted to for the joke. And I carried this damn TSA wand with me around for like six years trying to figure out a great idea with it. And where, you know, I could vanish a coin in one hand, and I grabbed the wand, and it beeps over my pocket. Damn it, I gave it away. You know, this thing was giving away where the where the, the coin was at all times. And I tried to work on this bit for, because like, to me, that's a very funny idea. With you try, a magician trying to do a magic trick, vanishing something metal or a coin, and then this TSA wand that happens to be nearby is always giving away where the coin or the magic. It, it still is a funny idea to me. And you think I can figure out how funny that is? I cannot get the funny out of it because I just, I tried it for years. So there are ideas where where you try something and you go, I haven't got it right. And sometimes you share it with somebody or six, seven years later, they go, I've got that idea. You know, this is what it is. And so, um, but that is one of those ideas I still to this day have not figured out how to make funny or entertaining in the way I, I would normally do something on stage. But you know. Have you ever made something where it's like you're working on it for years on end? It's almost like a songwriter like working on like a certain riff and they just don't know how to plug it into something and they have certain things or lyrics or riffs for 20 years and they don't know how to do it and then they give it away to someone else and then they turn it into like the next big yes. hit. Do you have sp specific bits that you've given to other people that have been successful? I've shared a few things with other people that have taken it to another level, you know, and they've used it to their advantage. And, and yeah, because everyone thinks differently. And then, you know, when you work on something for a while, you get tunnel vision, you know, where you just cannot veer away from that you just have your eye on the prize you see, because you've been work you've been too close to the project yeah you know what i mean and so when somebody else sees it fresh eyes fresh ideas and you sit there and think well how do, how the heck do i come up with this now and so so yeah it does help when you give it to somebody else you know what i mean and then they look and go well add, let's add this line in here let's do this and you go, oh my god I never thought of that never and then now it becomes a hit song or or a hit trick or an idea that, or a product that's going to go on well like a shark tank you know these people come on a shark tank all the time with I'd say 70% of an idea or 80 and then those guys and ladies who are sitting there with the money the time and the connections they go yeah but if you would have just yeah the sponge is a good idea if you just make the sponge a happy face that'll sell it you know mm. or if you just had velcro on the back of this wouldn't that be oh my god that's it well that's why they get paid the big bucks because they yeah. they understand you know certain products and how you have to make it user friendly and and because you may have taken to the goal post you just need something to kick it in that's that's what people do yeah, I mean, all, all you need is someone from the outside to come in and be like, hey, what if you did it this way? And you're just yeah. like, oh, it's so much better. Isn't it crazy? Well, it's like when you eat at a really fine dining restaurant. Yeah. And you order a really expensive meal and you put it in front of you, there's a certain way that the chef made that plate to look. That's why these high-end chefs are who they are, the way the potatoes are and the meat and, also, and, and the vegetables. And when, if you notice at a really high-end restaurant, you know, when they put that food down, they turn the plate so it's presented the way the chef made it for you. Yeah. The three carrots and the potatoes, and that's that makes a difference. You see it upside down, that plate of food does not look the same way to that chef. Yeah. And, and when you have these high end chefs from, you know, um, from Ramsey to all these other people, they design a meal to be art, presentable, and also edible, you know, and that's what makes them who they are, not just, you know, we're at TJ or Friday's making some cheese sticks. Exactly, know? exactly. Well, I appreciate you taking the time today. I do want to wrap up this interview by asking you something I ask all my guests. Sure. Um, Work-life balance. You're a married man, right? Yeah. Like, you, you have other things that are very important to you, and you got a hectic schedule. Mm -hmm. But you've also been doing it for years, so I'm, yes. I'm uh, curious to know how you kind of operate that, how communication levels are you know when it comes to balancing that 
Yeah. I don't think there's such thing as work-life balance, but like no. you make it work. Yeah, you do. Um, I think it's work hard, play hard, meaning, and the person you're with, make sure they understand that, but also make sure you understand them. So, you know, my wife's great at this, you know, in the sense of, hey, I want to watch a movie. Hey, let's go do something, you know. It's our time, you know, let's do that. And and then I'm also really, really hard on going, you know what, we're going for dinner, the phone's staying in the car, staying in my jacket body, it's not going to go on the table, you know, when we're having dinner or a nice outing because I want time with you. I want to look at you, I want to talk to you, I want to listen to you and be present. And the biggest thing right now in life, and I can say this, because my phone is in my hand every second, and everyone know, who knows me knows that, um, be present. When somebody's talking to you, listen, you know, and react. Don't just look at something. And I'm, I'm, I got the problem too. I'm, you're talking to me. I'll be on my phone. Right. I'm listening to you, and I'm not. And then, but I will go. Sorry, didn't hear a damn thing you said. Yeah. Please repeat yourself. And I'll, I'll be honest with myself. I wasn't listening. I wasn't paying attention. But I wasn't. So you know. So for work-life balance, you know, I write a list every night before I go to bed. An actual list, not on my phone, because my phone's too accessible, and everything's on my phone. I actually write a hand note, and I put it by the coffee maker in the morning, like I did today. And it said 10 a.m. interview with you, you know, and that was my first thing to do. And so I got up, combed my hair, made a coffee, and that was all that mattered. It was coming here on time, doing the interview with you. And then after this, it's going to go to UPS and drop some Amazon stuff off. Yeah. And then I'm going to come home and I got another meeting, you know, and, and then I'm going to do going to go and work in my yard, put some yard lighting in. And then I'm going to go and do my show tonight, you know, and hang out with my wife and have dinner with her and pet my three dogs and a cat. But I write things down because I like to cross things off a list. I feel like I accomplish better things that way and I succeed each day and so when I have dinner with my wife I write that in there you know what I mean or we're gonna go take a massage together or we're gonna go see a show I write that in so I look forward to it so say tonight we have some friends over to the house and it's game night or well at five o'clock whatever I'm doing it stops I'm done or at 7 30 yeah. and I work really hard and don't bother me I'm working hard don't give me you know don't give me um, hell for having my phone in my hand I'm talking to you this is my let me be me but at 7 30 Phone's going to stay in the kitchen. We're going to have friends over, have a drink, play some games, have a laugh, whatever the heck it is. And I'm done. I'm literally done. And I can enjoy myself, have a few drinks. You know what I mean? If I get a little drunk, let me get drunk. I'm off. But next morning, get up like this, do an interview, do whatever it is, and be pro. And really, I really section things off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I look forward to working hard. But I also look forward to at 730 putting my phone down and being present with you and my friends and having a great time. Because yeah. I look forward to tomorrow getting my phone again and being busy. So... So that's how I do things. You know, I think, write a schedule. Nothing's wrong with that. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? And be honest with yourself. Going, you're right. I shouldn't be doing this. The phone's down. I'm listening to you. Yeah, yeah you live and learn every day, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah, is, there, uh, is there any magic trick you could do for us right now? Sure. What you have? Yeah, why not? I'm, I brought something. I love, I, I love art. I love stuff. So I threw this in. I got some hairspray, because that's what I do right there. Nice. And then I got these postcards, which I thought were kind of cool from some of my trips over the years. And I got my little notepad here. Which, uh, which you can see, has, uh, has nothing really on that notepad just yet, but that's that's just gonna stay there. And I got four postcards. They're pretty famous postcards if you look at them. We got the Mona Lisa, which of course is right there. Yeah. And then who else we got? We got Dolly, right? Self portrait yeah. Dolly. And then of course that is the Scream, which is a very famous painting. And then of course the girl with the uh, pearl earring, right there. We got four postcards. So I'm gonna mix them up like this as i mix them up you can say stop whenever you want you're going to select one or you can even touch one or whatever you want just whatever you wish just touch any postcard you wish all right that one there okay that, this is the one you like that's the one this one right here so i'm going to show it to Doing you i'm not going to look at the cameras right but i'm, I'm going to show it to you you memorize what that is okay so have a look at that yep that used to be not to see what it is i know we're on a, a podcast also or televised here as well but you can see that you know what that is yes? yep okay so that's your choice you happy with that okay you did choose one of these, correct? Yes. Correct. Right, just like so. Okay. So watch very carefully. All right. I'm going to predict what you actually chose under here, okay? So watch carefully. Take this. Watch. No one watching. One, two. Watch there. Very carefully. It should slowly appear what I feel you might have chosen. Is that what you chose? I'm very impressed. It's the Mona Lisa, I think, right? That's yeah. the Mona Lisa. Hey, thank God. I got it right again. Still in business, people. Have you ever gotten that wrong? Yeah, sure. It's shocking when you see Dolly on there. You're like, well, that's not the right <laughs> <one."> <laughs> well, Murray, I really appreciate you coming in. I know this is your second trip to the uh, studio. Here, I know. I love so. the studio. It's an amazing studio. And I know we'll have you back as well. 
Exactly. Um, yeah. But this is episode 603, guys. We are presented again by here, Blue Wire, Blue Wire Studios. Thanks so much for having us here at The Win. Uh, check us out, Jack O'Hara TV. Like, comment, and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Check it out, guys. It gives them plenty of time. Cool. Thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah.